On March 21st, the German springtime offensive began when 6,000 heavy guns unleashed a pulverizing barrage at three points along the British lines. When the barrage came to an end and the Kaiser's troops began their advance across the British positions, their gains were rapid. It wouldn't take long before the Germans had recaptured most of the ground lost to the Allied offensives of the previous year. Manfred von Richthofen was back at the front with Jagdgeschwader I by the beginning of March to prepare for the coming battle. The Baron had been out of the fighting since the end of November, after he'd scored his 63rd victory over one of the SE-5As belonging to RFC No. 41 Squadron. By mid-January, von Richthofen, along with many of Germany's top-rated flyers, had gathered at Adlershof Airfield, outside of Berlin, to take part in the evaluation trials of new machines. The five leading aircraft firms had submitted 28 new types to be tested by the men who would eventually fly them in battle. Among one of the more promising designs being tested was a new biplane submitted by the Fokker firm. When the Adlershof trials came to an end, von Richthofen traveled on to his family home at Schweidnitz, from the earliest days of his rise to become Germany's greatest flyer, Manfred had carefully boxed up and sent home the numerous mementos and trophies of his career. Sitting with his mother and looking through the photographs spanning his time at the front, it depressed him to realize how many of his comrades had fallen in combat. When the day came for the Baron to return to duty, he was driven by his sister Ilza to the train station to begin his journey back to Berlin. Although he would have no way of knowing it, this would be his last trip home. Back with his flying circus, preparations began for the coming push. Although most of JG-1's pilots had been re-equipped with Fokker triplanes, structural problems still persisted. Kurt Wolf had narrowly escaped death when his upper wing had collapsed a few miles south of his home airfield. Although Wolf had skillfully brought the machine back to Earth, the event had shaken him and only increased the distrust him and his fellow pilots felt for the triplane. For now, the Yasta pilots would have to make do. It would be at least two months before the newer designs began appearing. The Allied squadrons were by now enjoying the benefit offered by the increased output of their nation's newest designs. The English SE-5As and Sopwith Camels were in widespread use up and down the front, while France's SPAD-13 a remarkable continuation of the sturdy SPAD-7 design was appearing in greater numbers with the Escadrilles de Chase. Bristol's two-seat fighter, the F-2B, had also proven its worth over the battlefields of France. After the airplane's disastrous introduction to combat during bloody April the previous spring, the Brisfit pilots had changed their tactics and had become a force to be reckoned with. Instead of flying the machine like a two-seater, the pilots had quickly learned to treat the Brisfits like a scout by aggressively going after the enemy with their front gun while the observer protected the tail with his Lewis. Andrew McKeever from Ontario, Canada had the good fortune to arrive at Number 11 Squadron shortly after the unit made the switch to Bristol's. Along with his observer, Lieutenant L.F. Powell, he began a remarkable string of victories that would earn him a spot on Britain's list of top aces with 30 confirmed kills before the end of hostilities. Powell would also be credited with a half dozen victories, making him one of the few backseaters of the war to achieve ace status. March began well enough for the Red Baron's younger brother. On the 11th, Lothar scored his 27th kill over one of the Brisfits belonging to number 48 squadron, and the following day knocked down two more machines of the same type during a running battle that lasted for 10 minutes near Cambrai. A day later, the younger von Richthofen found himself once again in battle against Bristol fighters, this time joined by Sopwith Camels being flown by pilots of number 73 squadron. In the ensuing battle, Lothar's top wing collapsed and his Fokker dropped from 4,000 meters to a controlled crash that left him badly bruised and with a broken jaw. This latest injury would keep him out of combat for four months. Manfred had taken part in the same battle with one of the Sopwiths falling to his guns to become his 65th victory. The Camel's pilot, another Canadian named Elmer Ernest Heath, came down on the German side of the line badly wounded but alive and would go on to carry two of the Baron's bullets lodged inside his body until his peaceful death in 1965. 